Did you know over 250,000 people are diagnosed with dementia each year? This is Robert Manny, host of Guys Guys TV, and this week my special guest is Leona Upton Illig. We're going to talk about caregiving, and it starts right here, right now on Guys Guys TV. You can also catch me on KCAA Radio here in Southern California, Guys Guys Radio, my worldwide podcast, and we're on UK Health Radio all weekend long. Guys Guys TV, Guys Guys Radio, thanks for your support. Okay, Guys Guys Radio, it's the interview portion of our show, and today we're going to talk about a subject that everybody knows about, but people don't really necessarily want to talk about it. It's dementia. And my special guest, his name is Leona Upton Illig. And you know that hundreds of thousands of people die from dementia every year. Relatives and numbers uh, are in the, relatives and friends number in the millions. It's a, the club nobody wants to be a member of, but there's some good news and there's some information out there. And um, my special guest, Leona, has done a wonderful job with her book. It's called Mom and Dementia and Me, A Caregiver's Journey. And she really takes us through um, learning about how her mother contracted dementia, the different types of dementia, and the entire process leading to the passing and transition, and then some of the things we need to do afterwards. I can relate to this because my mom, as I was mentioning uh, off camera to Leona, has uh, is suffering from dementia, and she is in the kind of the hospice uh, area, and she keeps outliving the hospice because she, she's so hardy. But anyhow, my very special guest on Guys Guys Radio is a subject that's close to my heart and something I don't like to talk about, but it's important. So we're here from you. Welcome to Guys Guys Radio, Leoma, Leona Upton Illick. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. I'm glad to be here. Well, you're a real expert. You've written a lot of books. And um, I guess this was a real, this kind of took, took you off in a specific direction that I think is going to be a seminal book for you because it's such an important uh, topic and you handle it with such uh, gentleness, yet uh, very effectively and focused and real information. So let's start right at the beginning because we want to uh, really inform people about dementia, which they hear the term and a lot of people are not sh exactly sure. You know, you've got Alzheimer's, you've got Parkinson's, you've got uh, Lemmy dementia, there's all different types. So what are the different forms of dementia? As I mentioned, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and Dewey, excuse me, Dewey, how do they differ and how can people identify each form of dementia? Well, to begin with, um, I'm, I must say I'm not a medical professional, so I'm okay. not an expert right. on this. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you what I learned from my mom's experience and, and how I tried to help her. Um, dementia, uh, every case of dementia is probably different, but there are some things that they all have in common. And one of them is physical infirmities and uh, mental uh, confusion. And you can go, there are different kinds to, to find out what, what one is from another. Unfortunately, the only way to know for sure whether you have Alzheimer's or Lewy body dementia or just a general dementia is unfortunately uh, after an autopsy and the doctors are able to examine the brain, then they can tell. But before that, they just have a list of symptoms for the different kinds of dementia, and they try to match up those symptoms with what your loved one is experiencing. So, for instance, my dad had Parkinson's, and he was very healthy, and all of a sudden he got Parkinson's. He was dead in three years. It wasn't one of these 20, 20 30-year things. He, it took him down. At the end, he said I, I, he didn't want a feeding tube. And like, he's like, uh, he was 92. He's like, I'm done. That's it. And uh, graciously, he went and we said, okay, if you if you want to go, go, dad, we love you. I had my, you know, my last moments with him and it was great. We really have a, such a great connection. I feel him in my heart all the time. So I was glad because he's such a, it was such a vital, active person with a big personality that I didn't want to see him like all curled up in a chair and not being able to eat. And also the aspect of dementia comes into Parkinson's, if, if I'm not incorrect, where he would get irritable sometimes and snap out and say, they're coming to get me and different things that were like very out of character for him. So I'm assuming this was a form of dementia. And I think a lot of people may not be aware that Parkinson's had some aspects of dementia in there. Oh yeah. And uh, Louis body dementia has some aspects of Parkinson. Like you just mentioned your dad being all curled up and then at the end, yeah. difficult for him to move around. Yeah. With my mom, uh, her gait changed. Uh, one leg seemed to come down harder than the other, and she slowed down quite a bit. 
And I wasn't, um, I didn't know enough to know that that's a symptom of uh, Lewy body dementia or dementia in general. So it's, it's really hard at the beginning to find it, to try to fit, figure out what kind of dementia uh, your patient has, um, but you just have to do the best you can and, and get help right from the start. Now, Robin Williams apparently found out that he had the, the, the Louis dementia. Uh, yes. yes. And that was right. part of Parkinson's. Yeah, I think he had Parkinson's also, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know. I don't know about the Parkinson's, but he did have a Louis body dementia, and they found that out for sure after he died. Now, what what was his in your experience? I'm not asking you if you know for sure, but was he because he took his life apparently? So I guess he knew that it was a downhill road from there, and he didn't want to he didn't want to go there. So That's he right. decided to take his in his own hands. So, um, what is the usual um, path if you have uh, the Louis body dementia? Well, the path uh, for my mom was that she knew something was wrong with her, but she wasn't able to stop it or control it. One day she was sitting on the couch and she said, Leona, there's something wrong with my brain. So she knew, but at a certain point, um, they, they lose all sense of who they are, at least with my, my mom's case. She didn't know who she was and she didn't know who I was anymore. And she went, she withdrew into a, her, her own little world. And that's usually the, the end of, uh, of the dementia systems. And I, am, I imagine Robin Williams, um, I think I read this somewhere that he did realize something was wrong with him. And being a comedian, uh, your whole life is making other people laugh and communicating with them. And uh, that was what he was going to lose, I imagine. Right. And he was so on all the time, so high energy. Yeah. So I guess he saw like, this is not going to be great. Um, it, it seems like also there's an overlap between Alzheimer's, Lewy dementia and Parkinson's, right? Yeah. So there's mm -hmm. three, there's three separate maladies, but they, there's aspects of each one that yeah. could land in the other pile. Is that true? That's true. In fact, there are more than those three, more than I know about. And what you can do is if you have a good relationship with your doctor, you, you explain all the symptoms uh, your mom's having, and then he tries to match it up with um, the, the symptoms that are for each uh, category of the disease. It's a, it's a wide body of diseases, but again, they're all, they're all uh, have one thing, have two things in common, the physical uh, deterioration and the emotional and mental deterioration. Mm -hmm. So what happened with, uh, give us kind of a snapshot of, the path that your mother took once you kind of figured out there's something wrong you mentioned in your book that you were uh you were not right about it, it, the, what you saw at, at the at first so what happened well the first thing that happened was denial mom was in her late 80s and it's easy to mistake um dementia for the symptoms of old age i would just say well mom's getting older these, these are the sort of things we're going to have to uh deal with like forgetting things or forgetting to pay a bill or um, not keeping up with me, walking around the mall and everything. So first was denial, but then the symptoms got worse. And uh, when I took her to the doctors, he mentioned uh, dementia. And, uh, and still then there was still denial. We still didn't think, oh, that can't happen to us. No one in mom's family had ever had dementia. There's no, there no cases of it anywhere. She didn't even know anybody who had dementia, and neither did I. So it was it was a really a learning experience, and it was a hard a hard lesson for us to both learn. For a while, mom, mom was uh, okay, but the symptoms got progressively worse, to the point where she couldn't live on her own by herself anymore. She had to have full time help, and then it also progressed to the point where she couldn't do little things anymore. She used to like to cook and she, she lost that ability. And then uh, she began to retreat into herself. Uh, there was a, a different little world there she was in now. And uh, I don't know if I was able to reach her or not. I would talk to her all the time. And once in a while she'd smile, but she was a different person at the end. Not, not, a, not a bad person or anything, but she was different. She wasn't um, mom anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, from conversations with different people, again, I'm not a doctor, you're not a doctor, we're regular people and we're, we've experienced something and we want to share our experiences. 
because other people, I think it sounds like everybody's experience is a little bit different and that, that's understandable. It, it sounds like, it's almost like as if when I'm with my mom that I, I can, my, my brother sees her often and he says, ah, she's not there. And I see her and I get her to smile. I show her my son on FaceTime and she smiles and we talk to her. Uh, we talk to her just like she can get everything. I'm just going to, just like I talk to my son, I talk to him like another person. I don't talk down to him like, because he's my son. I talk to him like a, a you know, there's a father-son dynamic, but I, I talk to him. And with my mom, I do the same thing. And it's almost like I can feel it's going inside, but it gets tangled up as the information goes through her, through her brain and being able to come process that and come out and verbalize a response is where things go haywire. Does that make sense? Oh, it sure does. In fact, at the very end, my mom almost totally um, stopped talking. She didn't have anything to say anymore. I, I would bring her her dinner and I'd say, how was it, mom? And she'd say, it's fine. That's what she always said. And the, the one of the hardest things for me was as after it was all over, I realized my mom had never told me that she was in any kind of pain. Now, you know, normal people, we all have all kinds of aches and pains. Mom never said, I'm in pain, I need help. Never said any of that. So was it that she wasn't in pain or was it, was it the truth that she was in pain and couldn't tell me? I, I'll never know. Yeah, that's, it's, it's interesting. You, you don't know, maybe it's the nerve receptors don't feel don't feel it. So what would be typically something that would cause discomfort and pain, maybe they don't feel it because their nerves are not um, sensitized to it anymore. Yeah. If there's any one good thing about dementia, it may be that, that they don't okay. feel it anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I, but I don't know. Now, um, let's talk about, and again, my special guest is Leona Upton Illig on Guys Guys Radio. We're talking about dementia. Her book is Mom and Dementia and Me, A Caregiver's Journey. And we're basically sharing, I, you know, stories and ideas about what's happened in my life with my mom with dementia and what's happening with Leona. And there's similarities, but there are differences. How did um, you mention food? Where your mom would, uh, would she, was she eating the same amount of food, and then she would just give you like it's okay? Because my mom is, um, she's eating like a horse, but but she weighs like 80 pounds or something. And it seems like, from what I think the doctors are saying, that she's not. Her, her system is not making use of the food and she doesn't respond unless she's really prodded to 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 respond otherwise she's just gonna look straight ahead yeah my mom had uh, had appetite changes that were drastic she would eat like a horse for a while and then she would eat almost nothing toward the end uh all she wanted to eat was pancakes so <laughs> I told the doctor, you know, this, this can't be good for her. And the doctor said, you have to pick your battles. Yeah. And this is not one of them. Right. She said, if, you, if your mom's happy eating those pancakes and, and she can still ask for them, let her have them. And so, and so we did, mm -hmm. but it, it wasn't a diet I'd recommend to anybody. <laughs> what are the, some of the other changes you noticed along the, as the months went by with your, with your mom? I know you had to move her into your house because at a certain point she was she fell down a couple of times and she, uh, I think she lived up, up, her bedroom was upstairs. And so you want to, you, you want the person who's afflicted on the ground floor. So it's easy for them. Well, tell right. us a little bit about the uh, housing situation, how you manage that. It wasn't easy because mom was from a generation that uh, if you were old, if you were a senior citizen, your family took care of you. And when my dad passed on, I told mom, don't worry, mom, you know, you'll never have to leave your farmhouse. And so that's one of the big mistakes I made. Don't try, don't make promises that you may not be able to keep in, in the future. Mm -hmm. And uh, I eventually, uh, it worked out all right. I finally got her to move, but it was because she had uh, actually had a fall. And, and I told her, mom, come to my house for a while and you recuperate. And uh, she wasn't crazy about the idea, but she said, okay, I'll do that. And we brought her down. And then of course she never left. She just stayed there. And as time went on, used to be when we first brought her down to our house, she would say, I want to go back to the farm and visit. And I take her back every week. And then after about a year, uh, she stopped asking. And I would say, do you want to go to the farm this week? And she'd say, no, no, I don't need to go there. 
And I think it was because she didn't know what I was talking about anymore, that the farm has sort of disappeared. So the, the, the slow decline, I think this is the real money question. You, like, and I'm sure you went through the same thing. With my mom, I'm like, I, it's her life. I told her from the heart space, you don't have to stay to take care of us. We'll, we're doing okay. It's up to you, whatever you want. And dad and your, your mom and my Aunt Claire and everybody else is waiting for you. But if you want to stay here, of course, we're here for you. It's, it's up to you. And in one sense, you're like, I don't want to have to have her existing, just sitting there, yet it's my mother. So it's a very tough in terms of emotionally, if you're a, a son or a sibling or whatever, as to what do you want? You want the best for your for the person who's afflicted, but it's their life. How did you come to terms with that? Well, I, I basically uh, realized that um, whoever that person was inside mom wasn't a person that I knew and that uh, she seemed content. Uh, whether she was or not, I don't know, but uh, she didn't complain. She she didn't come out of her room anymore. She stayed in her, her one room in, in our house and with her bathroom and everything, and she was fine with that. And uh, things sort of leveled off for a while. She wasn't, I mean, she wasn't going to talk to me anymore, and she wasn't going to watch TV. None, none of her hobbies, none, right. those were all gone. But But she seemed content as, as much as she could be. And so I thought, well, we'll keep on doing this. But of course, by that time, I had a lot of help. I had a, hired a, a part-time nurse to come in to help us out. We had the hospice nurse who came to help us out, which was great. I can't say enough good things about hospice. And then um, we also had a, a neighbor who stopped by and, and would spend some hours with her to give us some uh, respite. So uh, for about that last year, uh, things, even though mom was steadily getting worse, things were getting uh, calmer in the house. That might not make any sense, but. Now, do, do, do you sense that she had a, uh, she was aware enough to know what the situation was and she was kind of just playing out her hand or, or what? How, what was your sense as to what she was experiencing in terms of being cognitive of what was going on? Well, in the beginning, she was cognitive that something really bad was happening to her and she couldn't stop it. In the middle, uh, she was, uh, I wouldn't say antsy, but she was a little nervous about things. You could tell from the way she moved around. Uh, but toward the end, uh, I'm sure she had no idea um, what the situation was. And yeah, now, I don't think she had any idea. Now, working with the, uh, you know, medical community they're obviously they're going to prescribe things and i guess some of them are for so the person doesn't go into rage and things like that but because the 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 sickness if you will the illness doesn't go away what can they actually do i mean what is where is where did you notice the focus was from the doctors was it medication or was it comfort a combination of both or how did you what was your sense on that because i know my mother's got all these different pills and i'm thinking to myself why bother? You know, she's not there. Maybe cut her off on everything. And then I understood that, you know, there's certain things they need to take because they might, you know, fly off the handle or, or this or that. But you also, you don't want somebody sedated or whatever. So how did you come to terms with all the medications and all that that are going to come up? Well, in the beginning, there weren't that many med medications. There were her normal medications for high blood pressure and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And that's what she stayed on. And uh, the doctor, uh, really focused on comfort and making mm -hmm. sure she was comfortable. And that stayed that way for a long time until mom had a psychotic break. Uh, my mom was one of the most friendliest, kindest people you've ever met, but she did have a psychotic break where she came into the kitchen one day and said, uh, you've kidnapped me, you're holding me against <laughs> my will. It, was, it is funny now, and I laugh at it too, especially in the aftermaths, but, um, uh, she she broke at that point, and it wasn't it wasn't anybody I could control. Mom actually pushed me against the wall, and she was only ninety pounds, and so you know she can't push hard. But still, you'd be surprised at how strong they can be. Yeah. So when that happened, it was a long involved episode. But I called her doctor as, as soon as I could, and she said I'm going to prescribe an antipsychotic medication. Mm -hmm. It's a mild one, 
that would probably put your mom to sleep, but um, it should uh, ameliorate the, the uh, symptoms she's having right now and make her calm. And so we, we did that. I got the medicine, got gave mom the medicine, she slept through the night. The next day, she didn't remember anything that had happened, nothing. And at that point, the doctor said, well, um, there, there's a controversy about antipsychotic medicines and what they're used for. And I'm not a doctor, but right. explained this medicine we have her on right now seemed to keep her calm. And now she's awake and she doesn't remember anything, but she's still calm and, and, and she can do some walk around and everything. Let's keep her on that medicine for a while and see what happens. But she told me, you've got to keep an eye on her because those uh, antipsychotic medicines, they're great when, they're wor when they work, but there's also some bad uh, uh, symptoms connected with them. So you have to watch her, she said, and I did. And uh, thankfully that dosage uh, worked out fine for mom. And we kept her on that, that dosage for the, until she passed away. Now, at a certain point, you got to where my mom is now, is the, the hospice thing. So I th thought, oh, hospice, it's over. She's going to go in uh, three days or something. That was four months ago. And uh, they just checked out. They renewed it. They said all her vital signs are there. And she's heavy, actually. She's she's only 80 pounds. But uh, the caretakers say, moving her around is tough because she's like solid. So uh, tell us about your experience with hospice what people need to know about it. Because I think hospice usually means for most people, which myself included, somebody's <laughs> going to die in a couple of days. This is like last rites type of thing, but it's not necessarily that. It's like new equipment in the bedroom, some hospice nurses, which are different types of nurses, and a little more focused care that's paid for by Medicare and some insurance, excuse me, insurance policies. Talk to us about hospice. Well, I did not know anything about hospice when my doctor first mentioned it. And I said, well, that means mom only has six months to live. Is that what you're telling me? She said, no, that's not what I'm telling you at all. Um, that six month uh, period is what doctors normally say they'll, they'll uh, uh, verify hospice for a six month period, but then they'll renew it. She said, there are pe people who have been in hospice for years. Wow. But the, but the key is when you go into hospice, uh, you agree that you're not going to find a cure for what's what's for your illness. Uh, what you want is a palliative, a type of palliative care that um, helps you uh, deal with the symptoms and makes life bearable and ho hopefully comfortable. But uh, that that's what hospice does. A hospice doesn't try to cure you. But she said, suppose your mom uh, falls and breaks her arm, and and you want to get that fixed. We can, the doctors can fix that. And, and we you will go out of hospice and come right back in after it's over. Hmm. So once they explained all that to me, um, that was that was amazing. I just couldn't believe how, how grateful I was to them. And I will say this, uh, although I know the laws are changing all the time, uh, mom was on Medicare and she had some private insurance and together they both paid for hospice. We never had a bill. Hmm. That's terrific. Um, okay, my special guest, Leona Upton Illig. The book is Mom and Dementia and Me. So the time at the time of transition, if you don't mind my asking, did you find that your mom kind of uh, got alert right before the end, or was it just a slope, a downward path, and that was just kept going until she passed? Well, we we had a, an inciting incident, as okay. what they call it. Um, one night, uh, mom was uh, in her bed, and I was. David, my husband, and I were sitting outside in the, in the living room, and I could always hear her because I have a baby monitor set up here. And uh, I realized that she'd gotten out of bed, and I thought, I wonder why she's doing that, because she normally just slept right through. I heard her go through to the a window, and I thought, why is she walking to the window? And then I heard her fall. Mm -hmm. she, I, I'll never know what she was doing over there by the window, but she fell, and uh, she broke her hip. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, <clears throat> the doctor said, uh, we're going to take x-rays. And we had an x-ray team come right to the house, make, do all the x-rays, go back to the doctor. And she said, when, when I get all the x-rays, I'll call you and we'll talk about it. And she said, your mom, and the next day, uh, mom was ha had morphine, so she was okay. She was not in any pain. 
the doctor said uh, she's 92, and if you want, you, you can put her in the hospital, and they can try to fix her broken hip. And she said, if you if you don't want to do that, you just want to let things go as as the, the normal course, which is death. She said, you can do that too. It's totally up to you. So I, I talked to my husband and I talked to the nurse who was there at the time. And, and we all agreed, M mom wouldn't even come out of her room, let alone put her on a stretcher, put her in an ambulance, carried her to a hospital where she didn't know anybody. Maybe they'd be able to fix her broken hip. Maybe they wouldn't. And I said, I, I can't do that to her because right now she knows where she is and she's right. comfortable. And maybe she doesn't really know who I am, but maybe she does. I, I don't, I can't tell anymore. But I said, there's one thing I do know, she won't know anybody in that hospital and she'll be frightened and scared. And I said, no, mm -hmm. we're, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna let things take their course. And so they said that was fine with them. And uh, they made sure mom wasn't in any pain, not that she ever complained, mm -hmm. but uh, mom didn't complain. And then seven days after uh, she fell and broke her hip, she passed away. So that, when they say uh, people die of dementia, usually it's complications of dementia. It's you, you, broke, you break your hip or you fall badly or something like that happens. It, the, the dementia itself changes your brain in such a way that you're not able to function uh, the way you would like to, the way you would normally function. Now, when, if you don't mind my asking, when she passed, did you have a, a mixed emotions like, you were happy for her, but you were sad for yourself. And, you know, it's kind of like, or what? I don't know. That's, I'm being presumptuous. Please forgive me. No, no, that's fine. You know, I probably had all those emotions, but the main emotion was I was so tired. Um, and I think this is what I'd like to tell all the other caregivers out there is that you are going to get tired and you have to take care of yourself. Um, there's probably little or nothing you can do for your, for your mom or your, or your loved one, but uh, you, you got to take some time for yourself because, you know, the, the old thing they say about uh, airlines, if when you're on an airliner, put your mask on first and then help your child. It's the same thing. So when mom died, uh, I was exhausted. And I don't know, so was my husband. So was mom probably, you know. Yeah, so it was exhaustion more than anything. And then uh, after um, we had mom cremated and a little ceremony and everything, after that was over, then uh, some of the other emotions started to kick in. Uh, but I was surprised at the, uh, the hole in my life that this had created. Right. For, it was about five years, well, four years at, at our house and five years altogether that uh, she had been suffering from this disease and, uh, and now it's all over. And that, that was strange. It took a while to get used to that. Leona, uh, looking back, would, is there anything you would have done differently? <clears throat> well, yes. I, I wish I had known more about dementia and dementia systems, uh, symptoms rather. I wish I had gotten help sooner. I had the, I had the totally wrong idea that you know, I could take care of my mom. Why not? I know my mom better than anybody else. Of course I can take care of her, but I'm not a trained caregiver. I didn't know anything about dementia or, or dementia related diseases. I certainly didn't know anything about Lewy body dementia, which is what the doctors thought that mom actually had. I needed to get help right then and there. And I, I put off getting help. Don't, I was, don't do that. There are people around who can help you. You can go to your Department of Aging if you're in your county or state. Uh, you can use your, use your doctors. You can use support groups. There's one thing that uh, the pandemic has done for us. Before, when mom had dementia, there were no sort of no Zooms anymore. There, were, there weren't any. And so you couldn't connect with people unless you went in person. But if you're carrying someone with dementia, you don't have time to go out of the house for a couple hours and meet up with people. But now with Zoom, you can do that. There are support groups on Zoom. You can join them. You can find out what other people are experiencing and that, that's helpful.
Okay. My special guest, Leona Upton Illig on Guys Guys Radio. We're talking about dementia, mom and dementia and me, a caregiver's journey. And I'm learning so much. So thank you so much, Leona. Um, at the end of the book, I think you have a really powerful chapter that kind of gives lists of things that you should be aware of. It's chapter 14, checklist for afterwards. And you mentioned some things like uh, talk about the legal documentation, um, getting uh, multiple copies of the birth certificate, making sure the funeral home will notify Social Security, making sure the life insurance company is informed, contacting your lawyer about the will. These are important things that can slip through the cracks. There's no like 30 day time limit, but still, these are things you want to be on top of so they don't become a possible issue because you neglected to think about them. Could you share what you've learned and what you want everybody out there to our audience to know about these these measures and steps that need to be taken after the passing of a loved one who uh, died with dementia? Yeah, yeah. Um, you tr want to try to start early on in the process. You don't want to wait till after your mom has died because then you have all these other feelings and the things to do and it all comes down on you suddenly and it's hard to take. That's not the time to worry about, did I have a power of attorney or did I did my mom make out a will? Try to do that as soon in the process as you can. Even if your mom's not seriously ill, think about these things. One of the, the worst things is that when someone gets ill, those bills don't stop coming. The, they're going to keep on coming. And unless, if your mom can't pay those bills, somebody has to. If you have a power of attorney for financial affairs, mm -hmm. it makes things a lot easier. So do that power of attorney. The other thing is um, uh, there's something called uh, the MOLST. And I have to, it's the medical orders for life sustaining treatment, uh, sometimes known, also known as the advanced health directive. If you, if you can, while your mom is still um, able to talk and express how she feels, ask how she would like what she would like to do. If uh, she has a heart attack, does she want to be resuscitated, or does she want to just go? That's a hard conversation to have, and maybe you can't have it with her. But uh, it's awfully good to try to get her to sign some kind of document that says, "Well, my daughter will take care. Of, my daughter will make my decisions for me." That would be the easiest thing. And then you don't have to have that, that serious uh, conversation. And when you have that advanced health directive, post it everywhere in your house. Put it on your refrigerator, put it on the bedroom door, because when the EMTs come, and usually at some point they will, their job is to save your mom's life and all power to them. That's a wonderful, <laughs> a wonderful goal. But it might not be what, what you or your mom wants. Because when the, if the EMTs are coming and uh, they have a heart, you're dealing with a heart attack, they can crush your mom's ribs. Right. And our doctors explained that. She said, so, so think about that. Do you, do you want her, her heart to keep beating? Or if, do you want her ribs to be crushed when she, and she might never walk again? What do, you, what do you want happen? And so we finally decided on a do not resuscitate because at that point, um, mom, it was about six months before mom died. And we revised it a little bit. Oh, you can always revise these things. That's the other thing. Don't, it's not, you know, you give up completely. And do not resuscitate doesn't mean I'm giving up. I'm letting my, my mom die. It means I'm letting go and, and letting her, giving her the ability to let go too. I think it's also important to uh, be aware of the different uh, ramifications of Who's, uh, if she has a house or something, whose name that is in, keeping it in her name, et cetera, um, and what the ramifications are. And important stuff, would because it can, it can things, so many different things are connected, as you know, Leona. At, at the, for those who may not know, when somebody is there and they pass at home and you're there, who do you call? <laughs> What's the first thing you do? Hospice. The first thing you do is call hospice and they come to your house and they examine your mom and they uh, decide on the time of death. And then, and then you call the, um, the funeral home. But hospice does that, well, can do that for you too. You can tell hospice, please do this. You know, if you're, if you're so emotionally um, upset that, that you can't really deal with all that, they'll help you out. They'll walk you through it. The one thing about hospice, it's so great. When your mom dies, 
they don't walk out the door and you never see them again. They they come back mm -hmm. and they That's have great. support groups and they'll help you out. But yeah, for me, um, hospice told me when your mom goes and, and they know knew that when after she broke her hip that she was on the downward path. When it happens, call us first and we'll, tell, we'll help you out. Mm -hmm. And I did and they did. And I got to think it's important for people to be aware of. And, you know, we're a little bit past the dementia here, but I think it's important because dementia usually lives to leads to a passing where you should get the uh, what are the wishes of the person who knows that at a certain point they're going to go. Or you could do it 20 years in advance as to how, how do they want to be dealt with? Do they want to, uh, um, you know, stay be kept alive? Do they want a feeding tube? they do they mm -hmm. want to be cremated or buried or you have to have that stuff it's smart to do that in advance so you're not in a scramble and yeah. uh, put yourself in a victim position when you're dealing with all of these funeral homes etc not that i'm saying i'm not i don't mean they're looking to exploit you but you're you're in an emotional state and you don't know what you're saying yes to sometimes and you want to make sure that get the stuff out of the way early on correct oh, yeah that that's so true uh and, and like I said, you can you can revise these documents as time goes on. Mm -hmm. and in fact, you probably should every about every two months or so look at the situation and say, maybe I should be doing something different now. Mm -hmm. What would be uh, kind of your best? What do people really need to know about caring for an aging family member with dementia? That's the real question. What do you want them to know that every, you've got to know this? I, you can't do it on your own. You can't do it by yourself. You've got to get some kind of help. And it, it, you know, it almost doesn't matter what kind of help you get as long as somebody else is there to give you a hand. Somebody who knows something about the disease, a professional caregiver, uh, a doctor, a nurse, um, uh, someone who's been through it before. You need help. Don't, don't try to go through it alone. It's just too hard. Okay. Anything else you want to share with our audience and where can they learn more about you, your work, your other writing and, um, and this book where they can get that. Do you have a website or. I do. I have, I have a website. Um, but uh, the reason I, I'm here on this show and the reason I wrote this book was to try to help other people. Um, not everything I say will apply to, to a case to make your case or someone else's case. But if I can just say one thing, anything that helps make your um, your life a little uh, bearable and your mom's more comfortable. Um, that's what I wanted to do. So this book is sort of different from everything else I've written. I, I do mainly do fiction. <laughs> I've done some children's books and, and that sort of thing and short stories. This is my only nonfiction book. And uh, I never thought I'd have to write this book. I'm, I've got to tell you that. My mom and I, we, you know, we heard about Robin Williams and we loved Robin Williams, and we spoke, we both said, "That'll never happen to us. That can't happen to us." And it did. Well, what was your inciting incident to make you determine, as an inciting incident, a fiction term, as we know, to decide that you were going to write this book? Well, it was because uh, after Mom passed, a lot of my friends asked me, "Well, how did you handle this? Or what did you do when that happened?" And I started telling them. And then I realized, you know, it's it's best if I just write it down. And I had kept a journal of, of little things that had happened. So I, it wasn't that hard for me. And by the way, let me just tell you one more thing. Um, Please. When, you're, uh, when your family member has a disease, it could be any disease, keep a little journal of what happens. It doesn't have to be anything big. It can be um, the date, what happened, mom fell, result, didn't have to go to the hospital. Then when you go to a doctor, instead of trying to sit there and remember everything that happened, you have it on paper or on a computer file, doesn't matter. And you can give the doctor that file and say, this is what's been happening since I saw you. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. You did a great job. And thank you so much because, you know, one of the reasons we do Guys Guys Radio is, you know, we want to help men be at their best. And men need a lot of help these days. <laughs> but we want to help everybody and everybody, whether you're a guy or a gal or whatever, or a she or she or they, it doesn't matter. You're going to run into dementia at some point in your life where you're going to know somebody close to you that has it. And for whatever reason, I don't know if it's diet or the environmental particles in the air or something. I don't know, but it seems to be more and more prevalent now than it's ever been. And I don't see any let up in the, in the, in the rates of uh, 
diagnosis of dementia. So we need to be aware of it and we want to share this information. So I thank you for being on Guys Guys Radio, Leona Upton Illig. Once again, the name of the book, and it's a short book, but it's power packed and it's very well written. Mom and Dementia and Me, A Caregiver's Journey. Thank you so much for being on Guys Guys Radio. Such a pleasure to meet you. And, and I love the fact you're doing this work. Thank you very much. If you enjoy the guests and content I bring you each and every week to Guys Guys TV and Guys Guys Radio, please support us by subscribing and following on our platforms. Thank you.